breaking down prejudice. Um, now you think, well, that really doesn't apply to me. I don't have any prejudices. Um, unfortunately, most human beings are prejudiced in one way or another. And, and we need to be careful because God's word is very specific in that we don't live our lives in a prejudicial way, but that we live our lives under the auspices and in the, in the direction of God, the Holy Spirit in our lives. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter, one, uh, Acts, Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 48. We're not going to read the entire chapter. In fact, we're not going to read the chapter, but I'd like you to have your Bibles open. It's a rather lengthy chapter, um, but it talks, and, and it's the whole story of, about Peter and Cornelius and how, how both of these individuals had to come to a place in their lives where they had to relinquish their prejudices and be drawn into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, but also in a relationship one with one another. Acts chapter 10 is a pivotal point in the life of the church because it speaks and it tells us how the gospel spread across the world and crossed prejudicial barriers that had been set up. We see Peter using the keys of the kingdom for the third and the last time. We see and we realize how Peter used these keys before. He opened the doors to the Samaritans. Remember in chapter 8, the, Jew, the Jewish um, population didn't want to reach out to the Samaritans because they saw them as a lower people. And how Peter then crossed that bridge, that barrier between Jews and Samaritans. Then later on, we, we, we also see that how, how, how the gospel went beyond just the, the Jews and, and, and it started spreading throughout the area. And now today, we're going to discover how in chapter 10, God used the, the good news of Jesus Christ coming to earth to tell the good news to the Gentile world, of which most of us are part of today. That that good news came through this episode that we find in Acts chapter 10. All three of these cases speak to us and show us that prejudice is not welcome in the kingdom of God. There are at least two reasons for people being prejudiced in the world today. And maybe some of us are sitting here and we've got some sort of prejudice against someone or, or, or some population group, whatever it might be. Then one of those reasons is that people differ. There are certain nationalities, colors, beliefs, religions. There's even speech and looks, behavior, abilities and energies and positions of status, social standing, possessions, wealth, birth, heritage. All of these things can cause a person to become prejudicial in their lives. Prejudice arises when people feel that their differences make them a, a cut above someone else. And we must be careful that we never think that we're better than anyone else, that, that we are equal in our lives, and that God looks at us without any kind of prejudicial um, treatment in our lives. The second thing that we understand is that mistreatment causes prejudice. Perhaps you've been the one who's been mistreated, or maybe you've been the one who has mistreated another. And so these things even cause prejudice to arise within the lives of individuals. It causes us to become judgmental. It causes us to look at people in a different way. But we shouldn't be doing that at all. We should be seeing one another as Jesus would see us. Prejudice covers a wide range of behavior, such as when we ignore a person or neglecting someone, or joking lightheartedly, or we gossip, or we oppose, or we curse, or we abuse, or we fight against someone, or we persecute someone, or we pass someone over, or we segregate ourselves, or we enslave. All these things are the behaviors of prejudicial people. As we read this passage, we realize that the Jewish population of Christ's time, like many other population groups of the earth, at that time, had developed their own laws and their own customs, and their children were brought in that, in that same environment. They were brought up with the same laws and the customs that other people perhaps didn't have. The Jewish people of Christ's time, they were prejudiced. They didn't want to associate with Gentiles. They didn't want to associate with other population groups. They were very prejudicial. In fact, the reason for that is because they themselves, remember what I'd said previously on that point, is that people oftentimes, be, they become prejudicial because of being mistreated. And the Jewish people of the time had been mistreated, they'd been insulted, they'd been persecuted more than any other population group of the time. Even if we think today, and, and if we go back in history, the Jewish people seem to have always been the ones who have come under the hammer. Why? Why? 
but it's because God is working through the Jewish people. And when we realize that through the centuries, how oftentimes they had been conquered, army after army, they'd been deported, they'd been scattered, they'd been enslaved, so oftentimes. And we see no wonder that they had this prejudicial attitude. Even in Jesus' time, they were enslaved. They were occupied by Rome at the time. And so again, we see that, 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 that fighting and saying, we are not going to buckle down. We're not going to go and mix with these people. Their religion, Judaism, was the binding force that kept them together, that bound them. And they had this common belief, and they taught it to their children, and they, and they taught it to the adults, and they, that, that this was the binding force. This is what made them and set them apart, that they believed that God had called them to be a distinctive people, and that they were the only ones who would worship the true and living God. And that's true in a sense. Their belief in their rules kept them from being swallowed up by other population groups. They, 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 they refused to intermarry. They refused to associate with people. And so we see that the, the Jewish people just kept for themselves. Abraham, remember, and we saw a little snippet over there, Abraham had be, been given the birthright, and, and God said to him that through him, all the nations of the world would be blessed. But somehow down the road from Abraham to Christ's time, the Jewish people changed that. And they said, no, it's only us that are going to be blessed. It's only us who are God's people. And the witnesses. And so that, that witness, that first message, that covenant that God made with Abraham never was fulfilled completely. And yet we see that now through the Apostle Paul discovering Jesus himself, for himself, being a Jew, being a learned man, took the gospel beyond the confines of Judaism and started telling the, other, the others about Christ. Started telling Nicodemus, and, and, and not Nicodemus, Cornelius, about Jesus Christ. It was only that Israel had failed in telling the world the good news, that there is one God, that there is a God who loves them, that there is a way of salvation and redemption. Instead, God was for themselves. They were the only ones. In the world of prejudice, in, in Jesus' time, and here when Paul was writing, there was the prejudice of Jew against Gentile. And we think about that. There was this hatred. The Gentiles couldn't stand the Jews, and the Jews couldn't stand the Gentiles. It was Gentile against Jew. And then there was Gentile against Gentile. It's just this hatred that was going on between the population groups. One was better than the other, at least so they perceived. How is God, and how was God going to break the walls and the barriers of prejudice? How was He going to break those down that had been developed after century after century after century? These walls almost seemed impregnable. How was God going to do something in this particular case? And then, this is the point that we discover in Acts chapter 8 is how God worked through a man to break down the prejudicial barriers and walls that had, been seated, that had been built up. It is only God that can break down prejudice in a person's life. Without God intervening and God the Holy Spirit moving in our lives and changing our lives, we would be prejudiced. And believers shouldn't be prejudiced. Before Peter could save the Gentiles, God had a work in Peter's life. He had to reveal himself powerfully in Peter's life. And when you read the story in Acts chapter 10, you discover how God, when he was in this trance, how God had showed him when the sheet came down, there were all sorts of animals that were in there. And God said to him, Peter, eat, kill and eat of any kind of animal. And we know that that would go totally contrary to how Peter grew up with his prejudice, with his rules and his regulations. But it, was, it wasn't only Peter, but there was also Cornelius, here a Roman official. He, he had prejudice in his, own, in, in, in his life as well. And God had a work in his life as well. And so God spoke to him and revealed himself mightily in Cornelius' life as well. It's important that we come to understand who this individual was and that, 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 that God works not only in, 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 in Peter's life, who was a Jew, but in Cornelius' life, who was a Roman. And before Peter then could tell the, the Roman centurion about Jesus, something had to happen in his life. Before Cornelius could accept the gospel, something had to happen in his life. Him being a centurion, in other words, he was, he was a commander. He had a hundred people under him. He, he was living in Caesarea, right along the coast. And Caesarea was an important city. At that time, it was the capital, the Roman capital of the province of Judea. And here it was a Gentile city. 
It was a Roman city. And no respectable Jew would ever put foot, if it was at all preventable, to put foot into a Roman or Gentile city. It was taboo. Remember the prejudice. There was, there was, there was no association that was going on. Cornelius, however, had an unusual reverence for God. And as you read the passage, you see, and, and the word reveals how he sought God, how he prayed. He was a devout man who worshipped the one and true living God, the Bible says. In other words, he became disillusioned with the many gods of, of, of the Roman Empire. He didn't worship the emperor as being God. He was seeking something more. And probably he had an association somehow in the past that he rubbed shoulders with Judaism. And he saw how the Jews of the time worshipped one God. And somehow God had ministered to him. And somehow that was working in his life. He was a God-fearing man, the Bible says, who sensed the presence of God in the world. As he looked around, perhaps in circumstances, he knew that he was responsible to God. He knew that there was, there was one God. Perhaps, and we, we don't know exactly how that happens, but he was also benevolent. He was charitable. He gave a lot. He gave of his resources. And we see the character of this man. The Bible also says that he was a praying man. In Acts chapter 2, we find the, this passage, and he said, He and all his family were devout, were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. And when you read this in the Greek, you would find that what he was doing, he was praying to the one and only God, the God of the Jewish people. This is who he was praying to. He was totally unlike most of the Gentiles of his time. And today, many people who have a relationship with Jesus Christ, who know God, we're very unlike the rest of society. There's a difference, is that we seek God and we seek His will for our lives. He wasn't worshipping false gods. He was worshipping the one and true God. He most likely looked at the world around him, and he came to realize that there had to be one God. That this didn't just happen. You see, when he looked at the nature and surroundings, in fact, by the Bible says in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. And so when we look at this, and he looked around the world, and he realized that there was something more. God revealed his eternal attributes from his creation, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Cornelius came to the point in his life where he realized there was God. He became religious. He became a, a fearer of God. Cornelius was able to chew, to 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 almost become Jewish. He almost became a proselyte of Judaism. But because he was a Gentile, and because he was in the employ of Rome, he could never then actually go into the temple and worship. He would always be an outsider. Perhaps that's why he didn't become a proselyte. But it's interesting to see in Cornelius' life, even though he prayed to God, even though he acknowledged God, even though he was generous, even though he was charitable, even though he went the extra mile, even though he lived a high moral life, even though he was this good person, he still needed Jesus. He still needed salvation. And I'm sure that you've encountered many people that say that they are religious or spiritual, and yet they aren't saved. They might be living wonderful lives, moral, high, good citizens, and, and, and being charitable and giving to, to all sorts of needs, but yet without Jesus. And we find these people all the time. And oftentimes when you encounter them and you would tell them about Jesus, they would say, I don't need that. I'm good enough. I've earned my way into heaven. All the things that I do, I'm not like the guy down the road who, who's killed someone or who's, who's got this racial prejudice or this hatred against the boss or whatever. I'm not like that. But yet they are because they will still go to a lost eternity because of not knowing Jesus. It was obvious that Cornelius was obedient to God's law. Because in the way that he lived his life. And in every way, he was a model of religious respectability. And, and it's good to be, have respectability. But without Christ, our religion is dead. Religion is dead without Jesus. He was a good person in every way. You see, the difference between Cornelius and many religious people today and even in his time is that they realized that religious devotion wasn't sufficient. You can be as religious as, as anything. You can be in church every single day. 
and do all the religious things. You can even pray and you can even read the Bible. But without Jesus Christ, you're not saved. We need that relationship with Jesus Christ. And so that's what Cornelius had to come to, to understand. That's what Peter had to understand as well, is that the Gentile world needed Jesus. Many religious and spiritual people today are satisfied with their character and their good works. And they think that by this they will earn the kudos to get into heaven. Unfortunately, many of them have no concept of their own sinful state. Didn't the Bible say, and we find that in Romans, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God? Each and every single one of us fall short. Whether you're Jewish or you're religious or non-religious or whatever it might be, whether you're a good person, our sinful nature separates us from God. In his prayers, Cornelius was asking God to show him the way of salvation. He knew there was something lacking. Deep down in his heart, there was something more that he needed. In verses 13 and 14 of chapter 11, we find that he told us, and here, he told us that he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter, and he will bring a message through which you and your household will be saved. So the angel showed up in Cornelius' house and said, Listen, there's Peter down in Caesarea. He's living with Simon the Tanner. Go call him because he's going to tell you about Jesus and the way of salvation. He came to realize he wasn't saved. That there was something more about to his religious philosophy than what he had. There was something deeper. In many respects, John Wesley was very much like Cornelius at the time. He was a religious man. He was a good church member. He, in fact, he was a minister. He was the son of a minister. He belonged to a religious club, a club at Oxford University. His purpose in joining the club was so that he could perfect his faith, his Christian life. Wesley served as a foreign missionary. But even as he preached to others, there was something lacking in his own heart. The assurance of personal salvation. It was missing. In his journals on May the 24th in 1738, Wesley reluctantly attended a small meeting in London where someone was reading aloud from Martin Luther's commentary on Romans. And about a quarter before nine, Wesley wrote, he said this, While he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given to me was given to me, that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. So we can be religious, as John Wesley was. We can even be a minister and still not know Jesus. And we know that there are churches all over America that have ministers in their pulpits that don't know Jesus in a very real and personal way. And we need to be praying that God would cause a revival to, to sweep across America, just like it did in Wesley's life. Because just after Wesley confessed Jesus as his Lord and Savior and he had the assurance of salvation, there was a great revival that broke out in England and it caused a major so social shift within England. It caused people to seek after God and come and, and, and great social and, and help was generated through the Wesleyan revival. In our text, we see that God then sent an angel to Cornelius. And he immediately obeyed the angel's instruction. He sent the men off to Caesarea. It was about a two-day journey. And in the meantime, as, as then the men showed up in Caesarea at Simon the Tanner's house. And there Peter was upstairs. And, and, and God says to him, listen, there's some guys down there. I want you to go with them. So God was working in the life of Cornelius. He was working in the life of Peter. And so Peter goes down in obedience. But I want you to notice that, so that, that, that Cornelius was obedient to the voice of, of the Lord. He sent and he, he wanted salvation. He, he sought salvation. And Peter was being prepared. During that journey of those two days, God was working in Peter's life. That very day, God was working in Peter's life, revealing to him that this man, Cornelius, that he was to go with him to Cornelius' house. So we have about four days that go by. Because that very night, Peter invites them, why don't you come stay with me? Immediately we see the, the cracks and the fractures within prejudice being broken down. Because a Jewish man would never invite a Gentile into his house. 
to come stay. Never. And so we see the cracks and, and, and the disintegration of prejudice already occurring in Peter's life as he invited these men in. And so the next day of this two-day journey, they went back to Cornelius. Well, what was Cornelius doing in the, in, the, in the meantime? He was gathering his loved ones. He was gathering his family and friends together with the anticipation because God had told him that this man, Peter, when he comes to you, he's going to tell you about salvation. Cornelius was so excited about that. He had to share it. You know that he was a missionary and an evangelist before he even knew Jesus. How's that? For getting excited about God. And you and I who have Jesus, how much more should we be telling and inviting people to come and discover? And so when Peter was up on that roof, he had this little debate with God. And he said, you know, when God showed him the, the, the food, and then he said, eat of this. And him being an Orthodox Jew, he said, there's no way, Jose, Lord, I can't do this. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. He was a devout Jew. An Orthodox Jew in today's terms. He could never do that. And then God says, listen, what I've cleansed, I've cleansed. And so he got the message. And there was a message. It was more than just the food. It was more than just a message of what you're about to eat. It was something greater than that. The law, that war between Jew and Gentiles was now being broken down in the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross is the one that breaks it down. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 18, the Bible says, For he himself is our peace, who has made the, made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. God, through Jesus Christ, has broken down the barrier between Jew and Gentile. He has made us one people because of our relationship with God. So we don't separate ourselves. We love one another. And the walls of prejudice need to be broken down if we claim that we are followers of Jesus. And he said, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. So there is no more enmity between Jew and Gentile. If we both love Jesus Christ, we are one people. It's redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ who was our Jewish Messiah, who is the Messiah, and yet came to break down those walls. Then, and in one body to reconcile both of them through God, through the cross, by which He put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you, and were, you were far away, and peace to those who were near. In other words, the Gentiles who were far away, and to those who were near the Jewish people. He's preached to both to bring us close together. And through Him, we both have access to the Father, by one spirit. And we are one people because of the Holy Spirit and because of what Jesus did. Peter and Cornelius had to come to the place of understanding that, that this barrier of separation of prejudice had now been broken down in the person of Jesus Christ and that we can be together. And that's for a believer or a follower of Jesus to have any kind of prejudice in their life. Ask God to help you to overcome anything that would hinder your relationship with Jesus. In Romans chapter 3, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, Paul, Paul says, between Jew and Gentile. Therefore, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Whether you're Jewish or you're Gentile, you are a sinner and you need the redemptive work of Jesus Christ in your life which so many of you have received. But there are countless millions who still need to find redemption in Jesus. And He's called us to be the ones who will then deliver that message. Why did God choose a vision of food to teach Peter that Gentiles were not unclean? Well, because of, we have just said certain foods were deemed unclean. And we find that in, in Leviticus chapter um, 11 where God shows and shows the Jewish people of certain animals they weren't supposed to eat. And yet here God changes His mind and says, no. I want this, this, this separation to cease. I want us one people. In fact, Peter's Christian friends in Jerusalem criticized him. And they came and they, with their prejudices and they said, Peter, how can you even eat with those Gentiles? Look what it says in Acts chapter 11. And so when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of an uncircumcised man and ate with them. How dare you, in other words? Was there prejudice? You better believe it. And Peter then got into this debate and said, no, no, no. 
This gospel is for all people, Jew and Gentile. God had chosen to use the centuries of old regulations to teach Peter an important lesson about the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. He also taught Cornelius the very same lesson, that this message was for them. The point of this is all about, and what we have to understand, that God made it so clear to Peter. God made it so clear to Cornelius that there was, had to be salvation in Jesus Christ. But it was for every single human being. And what God declared clean was truly clean. God didn't simply change Peter's diet. He was changing his entire worldview. Peter's whole mind shifted. And he realized, listen, if God, when, remember what Jesus said, Peter, what do I make you fisher? I'll make you fishers of men. And, he, and, and, and if Peter wanted to be a fisher of men, he couldn't just say, well, I'm only going to be a fisher of Jewish people. No, he was a fisher of all people. And so he realized, and, God, and Jesus said, I give to you the keys of the kingdom. And what are the keys of the kingdom? It is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the kingdom is open to every single human being. God didn't simply change Peter's mind, uh, diet. He changed his heart. He changed his outlook on life. It wasn't only the Jewish people who were clean then, but the Gentiles could be clean as well. So both Jew and Gentile would become the children of God. God included both their unbelief of the, of, the, of, of, of the Gentiles and the belief of the Jews, and He made us into one people. Look what it says in the 32nd verse of chapter 11. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that He may have mercy on them all. So there's disobedience, but God's mercy is shown to every single human being upon the face of the earth without exception. And folks, we need to understand that. This is what, 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 what is meant when the Gentiles didn't have to become Jews in order to become Christians. There was that whole debate that was going on. And then the, 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 the Jews from Jerusalem said, and the leader said, no, no, they have to be circumcised, otherwise they can't really be Christians. And, and Peter said, no, 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 no. And Paul got into that whole argument as well. You, because you, that's not important. It's not the external, it's what God does in our heart. And while Peter was still speaking about the vision, that's the Spirit of God said, go, go with him. And notice that Peter then went with him and approached, and as he got to the house of Cornelius, there was a crowd already waiting to receive the gospel. He was so excited, anticipating the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, God is working behind the scenes already. He's always working. Even though you may not see it, God was working. And God was going to use Peter and to show him how the gospel was for every single population group. It isn't it amazing that Cornelius then telling people, listen, come to my house, come to my house. This guy Peter, he's an apostle. He's going to tell us about the way of salvation. Remember, he's speaking to, 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 to non-believers. He himself was a believer. And then tucked away right there in verse 29 of chapter 10, Peter comes to him and asks Cornelius, so why did you send for me? What? <laughs> what do you mean, why did I send for you? Uh, wasn't it obvious? Didn't Peter know that he'd been summoned to tell the gospel? Didn't he know that he was going to tell them about Jesus Christ? What, is, what, what, what kind of a question was that? Had he forgotten the great commission of Acts chapter 1 verse 8, where Jesus said to them, go into all the world, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the utmost parts of the world. Had he forgotten so quickly? In Acts chapter 11 verse 14, the Bible says that he will bring you a message through which you and your household will be saved. This is what Cornelius was expecting, that Peter was going to be the messenger, that he, he and his entire household would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. They weren't just Gentiles asking simply for a lecture about Jewish history. They realized that they were lost sinners needed, needing salvation. That's what they came to realize, that they needed to be saved. Peter got the message that it wasn't just food, but it was the message of the cross of Jesus Christ. Peter stated that God had shown him that he should never think of anyone as being impure or unclean. Cornelius recounted the whole episode of this encounter with the angel to Peter. And God was working this beautiful coming together of both Jew and Gentile. 
of both, with, who both had prejudices, and the walls were just broken. The, the whole discrepancy between these population groups had been broken down. What we need to understand from this passage is that God shows no favoritism. That He doesn't just choose one over another, nor does He accept people's prejudices. He comes to meet us. He meets all people who seek after Him. Here Cornelius was seeking after God. God heard his prayer. And he said, I am going to reveal myself mightily to you. Also, we cannot accept the notion that one religion is as good as another. This is contrary to Scripture. We, can, we can't accept that every other religion also leads to Rome and everyone will end up in heaven. Cornelius had a godliness and a religiousness and a morality, but he didn't have salvation. And so there are so many people, like I mentioned before, that have all this, but lack salvation. And some would argue today that we should leave Cornelius alone, because his religion obviously was part of his culture. Don't bother him. Don't try and force, or don't try tell them about Jesus. Just leave us alone. And that's so prevalent in the world today, is don't tell us about your religion. Just leave me alone. And yet that goes contrary to the gospel. We are told by Jesus himself is to tell people about the love of God. God doesn't see it that way. You see, apart from hearing the message of salvation and the gospel and trusting in Jesus Christ, Cornelius had no hope of salvation. And the world at large without the gospel, without the good news of Jesus Christ, is going to a lost eternity without salvation. And if there was ever an ideal audience for a minister to teach or, or a teacher to come to, it was that audience that Cornelius had called together. They were readily anticipating the message of salvation. They were there on time. Imagine that. They were there on time. They were waiting eagerly to hear the gospel. They were waiting to hear the minister come and share the good news. And that's exactly what Peter did. He came. And shared the good news of Jesus Christ. Peter's message was simple and brief. Christ lived. Christ died. Christ rose again. And he is the one all the prophets testified about. Saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. This is not rocket science. This is the, muck, this is the crux of the gospel. Is that Christ came. He lived, he died, he rose again. And that everyone, no matter who you are, can place their faith and their confidence in Jesus and be saved. Every single person. Didn't Jesus say, pray for your enemies? Now, I, I struggle. I, folks, I struggle. I admit it. When I, when I see what these groups like ISIS are doing to people, and the persecution of the church under the name of a, of a false religion are doing to people. And then I compare that to the good news of the cross of Jesus Christ, that God so loved the world that He made a way of salvation through the person of Jesus Christ. What a difference! And that's the hope that you and I have as believers. And that's the message that you and I must take. It is the simple message that we find in Acts chapter 10, verse 43. It is the message of redemption. It is the message of hope. And may you and I take that message and take it to the utmost parts of the world, wherever we may find ourselves, and declare it with confidence that Jesus is the one. He is the hope, and He is the only way of redemption and salvation. Take that message, make it yours, and share it with as many people as you can. Be like Cornelius. Be like Peter. Don't let any kind of prejudice prevent you or hinder you from being an evangelist or a missionary wherever you find yourself. Let's pray.